that's not even your style. No, honey, it's not so much the style, it's what carrying it means. It means you're on 4,000 bucks. Exactly. Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gita Mary and today we have to talk about the MS Birkin. We're focusing in on a very specific fashion phenomenon today. I have talked about sustainable fashion for almost 10 years also on this channel and I've also talked about designer fashion, luxury fashion and sustainability and how those things correlate and how those things also stand in sharp contrast to each other. But today I have to talk about this specific thing. I'm on TikTok like so many others and one of the things that keeps popping up on my For You page on TikTok is videos about the Hermes Birkin bag. The main gist is that this is a very expensive bag that it seems like a lot of people really want to get but not everyone can get. And the thing that sucked me into this deep dive, the rabbit hole that is this thing, is that apparently you need to take several measures if you want to even be considered to purchase one of these bags. The fact that you cannot just waltz into an MS store with a million dollars and get a Birkin bag if you want. Like there are more steps, all the hairs on the back of my neck just stand up and I thought there's something here to talk about. There's something here to talk about in terms of how we understand prestige and luxury, also in terms of sustainability. And whenever we elevate a product, whenever we idolize or romanticize a product or a brand, you rest assured that I'll be there to take them down a peg and that's what we're doing today. So take a deep dive with me into both the environmental and cultural impact of quiet luxury. Now one of the primary criticisms that I as well as other people regarding sustainable fashion always like to point out when it comes to sustainable fashion is that reduction of product reduction of how much is produced is rarely a part of brand sustainability profile. They like to do a bunch of other stuff and we have seen it all. We have seen the recycled polyester, the conscious collections, we've seen the organic cotton and the take back programs, but the most effective initiative to take in order to drive down emissions from the fashion industry is reduction. Globally today, we are producing more than 150 billion pieces of clothing every single year. There is no way for that to be sustainable, no matter how much recycled polyester you're using. That that cannot be sustainable. So that is my number one critique. As such, you would think that I love brands like MS. They're so exclusive, they produce very little product, which means that not everyone who wants a Birkin bag can get a Birkin. Although sometimes it seems like half the internet is gawking at it. With bags like the Birkin bag or the Kelly bag from MS, very few are made. And what's pretty brilliant about this is that when there is a scarcity of product, it drives up consumer demand and it also increases the amount of people talking about the product. So in many ways, this should be a win-win for the planet and for the business, right? She said, indicating that a lot more is to come. Not everybody can walk into an MS store and buy an MS Birkin bag. You have to prove your commitment to the brand in order to be considered. And from what I can tell online, it seems like what you have to do is you have to create a relationship with not only the brand, not only a specific boutique, but a specific sales associate. If you're building a relationship with a person that works in MS, you're more likely to be considered. And perhaps you're wondering, how do you do that? Well, you build a relationship with someone from MS by continuously shopping there. And some people online rave about having spent more than $100,000 on additional MS products in order to be considered for the Birkin. And I'm guessing that many of the purchases in the process are products that the consumer would otherwise not have bought, potentially not at least, if it wasn't for the scarcity of the Birkin. This is how one high fashion blog explains the process of buying an Hermes Birkin. When you enter into the store, you must find a sale associate willing and available to assist you. It literally says willing. Ideally, a friend or relative will introduce you to someone with whom they already have a relationship. So you sort of have to know someone who's already in, in order to be considered. And you have to make sure that you dress well when visiting the boutique, preferably in MS clothing and shoes. You also have to demonstrate knowledge of the entire MS brand, as well as the history of the bag you want to purchase. And you have to make sure that you're making multiple purchases at the same MS boutique, ideally with the same sales associate, to establish a purchasing history. Purchase from a wide range of MS products so that you do not appear to only be interested in the Birkenbag. Consider purchasing scarves, belts, jewelry, 
makeup. If you're a sustainable fashion girly, I think you just got the goosebumps. And mind you, you don't even get to decide which bag you get. It's very likely that you're able to choose from one or two different Birkin bags if you're lucky and if you turn it down because it's not your color scheme or not your style you might not be offered a different one <sighs> i know this feels like a cult or at least a very very well thought out scheme a scheme where the scammer makes the scammy feel convinced that they are lucky to get the opportunity to be scammed the exclusivity of it makes it feel like a cult, that's all I'm saying. So while very few bags are made, the business model is still unsustainable, no matter how they try to frame it. Now let's take a step back for a second and talk about how the Birkin came to be, because it's actually quite an interesting story. So the Birkin is inspired, or the muse of the Birkin is inspired by Jane Birkin, a singer and actress, and in 1984 she sat on a plane next to the CEO of MS. And one of the things that you perhaps don't know about Jane Birkin, or perhaps you do if you're well wandered in fashion history, is that she used to carry a big wicker basket around like a bag. That was her bag, a big wicker basket, you go girl. And on this plane in 1984, all the contents of this wicker basket spilled out when she tried to put it into the overhead compartment. And that got her and the CEO of MMS talking about the perfect bag and in the process of that they designed the Birkin with her as the inspiration. And this is not just fun trivia, if you look at pictures of Jane Birkin with her Birkin bag you will see that she handles her Birkin in a significantly different way from how anyone else online seemed to carry them. She stretches them, she puts them on the ground, she decorates them with all her trinkets, she wears them to shit. You have something, you like it, you wear it, and that shows. And it doesn't seem like a lot of the Birkin bags that are bought or portrayed or showed in public or to people online are used in the same way today. It seems a lot of time because of the prestige that comes with the brand, because of the price tag of the Birkin where the cheapest one is around eight or nine thousand dollars, they end up sitting on a shelf in a walk-in closet and they are styled, they're put into outfits, but they're not worn and they are not witnesses to the life of the wearer in the same way that Jane Birkin used to wear her bags. And I don't think Jane Birkin ever paid for her Birkin bags, but in the 80s and 90s, the bags were also not the same price as they are today. They have increased in price significantly and they also continue to do that, even the ones that have been resold. Like the price is just spike. But she also only had one at a time and she only had five in her entire life. And I kind of love that she was never too precious about it to use it. Wicked Basket Queen. There is an important question to ask, and it's whether or not MS is a sustainable brand. The cheapest MS Birkin bag is around eight or nine thousand dollars, and the most expensive goes for roughly two million dollars. And with that sort of price tag, should come some sort of sustainability, responsibility, transparency, right? This is how MS describes their own sustainability efforts as a responsible company. MS strives to limit its impact on the world while respecting nature, the source of its exceptional materials. In this regard, transparency, security and local dimension of supply chains are the subject of particular consideration. You don't get a whole lot from that description though. If you think that sounds a little vague, it's because it is. In terms of sustainability initiative, MS is picking some low-hanging fruits. They're using organic cotton and they have set significant goals in terms of carbon emission reduction in their supply chain. And there is a dimension of quality. When you buy a Birkin bag or any other luxury bag like this at this price point, you get a certain quality that means that you can own this bag for the rest of your life. And that significantly reduces the impact of any product wearing it for the duration of your life. But you can say the same thing about quality products that cost less than $9,000. But see what we did there. We talked about the environmental impact and the sustainability initiatives of MS and ended up talking about how consumers use it. And it's because consumer use phases account for a significant part of the impact, but that has actually nothing to do with what MS is doing in terms of sustainability. So if we're keeping the eye on the ball here, what are MS actually doing? They are like so many other, both fast fashion and luxury brands talking about 
significant improvements to supply chains that will reduce carbon emissions, but we very, very rarely see any concrete documents or evidence or proof of what those significant initiatives are or what the impact of them will be. It's kind of like they're saying, we are also doing stuff or we plan to down the line um, and we're not going to update you on it, actually. Just trust us. One thing to note is that MS is not paying all their workers fair wages. And you should think that with the price point of roughly $10,000, people that made the bag would be compensated fairly. And they are not. The Fashion Transparency Index awarded MS a 21 to 30% score, which indicates limited transparency, mostly in the late stages of the supply chain where we tend to see the higher wages anyway. MS supply chain is also not certified by any critical labor standards. And I think that tells you everything you need to know. We are indeed working on a trust me bro basis. And there's also more to be said about materials. The brand use of leather, wool, down, fur, exotic animal skin, shearling, exotic animal hair, horn and silk also significantly affect the impact with exotic textiles like crocodile skin or ostrich feathers, for instance. There are no certifications in place to make sure that these animals are treated fairly. There are no one that's looking for the animal abuse that continuously takes place in these industries. So whenever any brand is talking about how they pay respect to the nature that produces the exceptional materials that they're using in their supply chain, meanwhile they're using materials that are definitely causing animal abuse, just seems a little shallow. Sadly, it's not the norm to shy away from using these materials. And in terms of MS, well, a lot of their transparency only stretches to the first part of the supply chain, the very late stages of the supply chain. Which means that when it comes to the early stages of the supply chain, the resource extraction, there is no transparency. So this is easily the most late stage capitalism-esque thing I've ever seen in my life. But I think it says something very interesting about the cultural impact of designer fashion and fashion identity. In many ways, what Amez is doing is a genius contrast to the world of fast fashion. When you can get everything, anywhere, all the time, the blatant overconsumption removes exclusivity. And many designers today have launched collabs and more affordable collections with high street brands, which feels like leaving the private road open during rush hour because the more easily available something is, the quicker the prestige of it fades. I guess there's no point in explaining thoroughly that when you pay thousands and thousands of dollars for any product, it comes with prestige when it comes from a brand with a logo, with a design history, and the association, the cultural, the social association of that brand is what you buy. It's not necessarily only about quality and having a good product and really liking the look of it, but you buy into a certain identity, a certain lifestyle and the prestige that comes with that. And that's the main selling point of designer labels and designer anything. And it's always been this way. Designer fashion is a tool to distinguish yourself from the mainstream, from the lower and middle classes, to signal something better, more successful, and excessive wealth. However, fashion changes and so does luxury fashion. While previously, decades ago perhaps even, you could set yourself aside from the masses, from the mainstream, by wearing something flashy with a big designer logo on it, but that will not necessarily get you the same place today. Wearing big flashy designer labels won't grant you that same level of prestige, not anywhere at least, and not necessarily. On the contrary, big flashy logos today are often considered tacky, like you're trying too hard, completely void of personal style and taste. You do not join the club by wearing a Louis Vuitton logo bag and Chanel flats anymore. What seems to be holding the torch of prestige currently is the quiet luxury for those in the know. Because it's the quiet luxury that doesn't scream at you, the quiet luxury that rather ignores you because it doesn't need validation from someone who does not recognize it. And there are several examples of luxury brands not opting for flashy logo products, but rather sticking to recognizable designs for those in the know. However, one thing flashy logo products and quiet luxury has in common is that you have consumer agency. You get to decide if you prefer 
flashy logo, so quite luxury. You have the consumer power to buy whatever you want if you have thousands of dollars. But still, suppose you want to set yourself aside as a fashion aficionado. You, and by you I mean the world, I mean brands, I mean luxury fashion, tend to remove consumer agency from the purchasing process by not allowing everyone to get into the club, not allowing everyone to buy what they want, because that removes exclusivity and that removes prestige. You're putting all the power into the hand of the brand basically. When the brands can choose if you are worthy or not, we have created a new level of exclusivity that would otherwise have been unattainable. And this is a familiar strategy. It's not exclusive to the fashion world either. We see it in real estate, in cars, we see it with wine trading and many other industries. In many ways, although I find it deeply concerning that anyone would idolize a brand to the point of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to feel better about a version of themselves or worthy of the recognition of these certain groups, I also find it incredibly interesting that a fashion brand is able to do this. And this is not to say that you can't spend your money on what you want. That is your prerogative. You can do what you want. And it's also not to say that I am bitter or jealous that I'm not able to participate in the prestige. I have no real desire to. I have almost exclusively shopped secondhand for almost a decade. She's doing okay. Came from the fashion industry and now we are here hating on it. Which is fair, I think, because so often it's a shit show. I think as we have approached this level of consumerism and this stage in consumerism that we are able to identify when we are idolizing a brand just because of marketing strategies and advertisements, all kinds of external values that's being imposed upon us. And we see this in television, in movies, in TV shows. I think one of my first instances of noticing or learning about the Birkin and how much I should respect it, aspire to it, crave it and desire it was in Sex and the City when Samantha gets a Birkin bag for Lucy Lou but then takes it for herself. For a bag? It's not a bag. <laughs> it's a Birkin. If you know, you know. How we feel about designer labels and how we feel about any product and company is so often not up to our own understanding. It's more so externally imposed upon us. And I think that says something both interesting and concerning about our consumer culture. Bag. Do you like it? Hello, I'm a girl, it's a purse. Not just a purse, it's a Birkin bag. In my own point of view, I think luxury products can be great if some of the luxury comes from knowing that people were paid fair wages and that responsible materials are used and that all these things are in order in order for us to enjoy these products. I use silverware every single day. I drink out of heirloom crystalware every single day. I love surrounding myself with good quality things and things that make me feel like everyday situations in my life are just kind of elevated. The same reason why I don't necessarily have a wardrobe that's divided into festive and special occasions and then my everyday wear, I tend to mix and match because I love the things that I own and I want to use them. Which is why it fascinates me and worries me that we are buying things, spending thousands and thousands of dollars on something, to not really wear it and to not let those things then be a witness to our lives. I think that's why I love what Jane Birkin did with her bags. It's also kind of a protest, a rebellion against how we should elevate or idolize these products, materials and brands. Use them and let them die because that's the only way they will ever get close to making up for their impact. I hope you like this video. Let me know down in the comments what your thoughts are about prestige and luxury fashion. I would also love to know if you have any thoughts about Hermes or the Birkin bag, or if you want me to go into detail with other brands and products, let me know down below. If you're interested in more sustainability deep dives and impact analysis reports, hit that subscribe button. That would make my day. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day and take really good care of yourselves. Until next time, bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!